Thank you very much for accepting this interview. How are you doing in Sweden now? Yeah, it's great here. Uh, it's uh, starting to be spring, uh, which means that it's around uh, zero degrees still, that it's, it's getting warmer and uh, the light is returning. So yeah, people are happy. Okay, that's good. So can you please explain us, what do you do for Melody Festivaling? Uh, this year I was working on uh, the contest Bible, uh, the fact articles that um, uh, were published at media.melodifestivalen.se, uh, that web page that uh, SVT put out uh, this year to uh, provide information for journalists mainly, but also for uh, fans who, who want to know everything about what's going on. Uh, and I was also working with uh, the actual TV shows, uh, reviewing scripts you know, from a fact perspective, and also um, uh, like providing some suggestions and answering questions from, uh, from different parts of the project, like um, when are we usually publishing uh, this and that information, how, how was that usually going on, or how many times did this artist participate in Melody Festival, and, or you know, wh whichever kind of information that, that might be needed um, at a certain time, you know. The different songs where, where the word uh, und, hurts, has been used in Melody Festival, and because they wanted to use that for a short uh, clip, and um, you know, different, different stuff like that. So um, it, it's kind of diverse, um, but this year it was a lot focused on these articles. So you're basically the encyclopedia of Melody Festival, right? Yeah, this is what they are saying internally. Um, I, I didn't, not viewing myself as an uh, encyclopedia like that, but uh, to me it's just natural, you know, it's an interesting topic, so I remember the information, and I was there because I've been working on location since 2007, so I've been experiencing a lot of this stuff. So, first one, I would like to talk to you about Melody Festival in 2007, because it was my first Melody Festival. How was everything? Because it was one, one of the first editions that Sweden sent like a real big name to Eurovision because they are they are were a big name in Sweden back then. They are still quite famous for sure, but I think that was very so. It, it, many people were surprised they were even taking part. Mm. Uh, yeah, the Ark um, uh, Melody Festival has um, uh, the the now former executive producer Krista Bjurkman. Uh, he uh, has uh, described his uh, 20 years on Melody Festival and with um, uh, the Ark as a special reference point that uh, uh, that was a door opener for him when he worked on bringing in big acts and big names for the show. And then when he got the Ark, that really helped him to get other big names and, and to open up Melody Festival and that's, uh, as a pop contest and not uh, uh, some niche uh, contest with a specific kind of music like Schlager that was only on for, for uh, a specific time of the year because he identified that um, it was very important that Melody Festival and provided hits songs for the charts and the arc helped with, uh, with that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the next question is actually about Chris B. Orkman. He's leaving now. What would you say it's like his biggest legacy for the competition? It's going to be difficult to point out because he did a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, it's hard to point out one thing because um, um, he he has been working um, so much with this that he has become uh, like um, identical with uh, Melody Festival, and he is the Mister Melody Festival, and for people in Sweden, and he, he's been given a lot of credit and um, uh, also a lot of criticism through the years. And I'm the sure. criticism was was uh, usually it's not well founded, um, but uh, you know he's this guy who's uh, he's a fan of the contest. He uh, is working twenty four seven on the contest. And it's very, very hard to replace him. Uh, he um, brought Melody Festival from something that was a little bit, well, it was, it was a lot of behind the curve. Uh, the music in Melody Festival was at the best a few years behind the music on the charts. Um, and uh, it was a lot of like 
they, they tried to replicate modern music, but it was different and it didn't really work a lot of the times. While now it's really usually close to the charts in, in pop music, it's like six months behind the curve or, or something like this. So it's very contemporary. Uh, so that's like if you should pinpoint one thing, it's that the music has been updated and becomes hit songs. Uh, if you look at Spotify in Sweden, um, it was like, yes, at least 75% of, of the songs in top 20 uh, the day after the final came from Melody Festival this year. It was very successful this year. Um, so so um, that's like, um, I think, what he's most proud of. So uh, let me ask you another question about, oh, it's on the same topic. Just came to my mind something that uh, if we take a look on Melody Festival in 2002, 2003, maybe even 2004, and Melody Festival in 2007, 2008, 2009, it feels like a totally different show. <laughs> it feels even it's a different country. Like, so what do you think was the changing point? You already pointed out the art participating, but do you think that like there was like the ideology of the organization change or the ideology of the artists taking part changed? Um, yeah, it was a learning process for SBT when it came to the production uh, of the shows, how you can make it better. The technology advanced um, and um, also, um, you know, the, the traction, how attractive it was for, for singers to take part changed. Uh, you got this platform with um, uh, a very huge public attention. You can just place your song there and you can get a hit. Um, you're risking something maybe, uh, but it became much more attractive while before Christy Birkman started and before SVT re remodeled Melody Festival in 2002, it was like um, bad publicity to take part in Melody Festival. And uh, it was just uh, um, very, you know, it wasn't cool at all and it wasn't related to the charts and it wasn't contemporary. So it was just a certain kind of singers that took part. Uh, so this was a huge change. Even though some people say it changed a lot, I, I can see still people saying that there is no diversity in Melody Festival, and it's always the same composers again and again. How do you feel about this? Do you think it's true? Do you think Melody Festival is lacking some diversity? Do you think uh, the organization should try to bring some different people on board? Um, yeah, well, there, there have been a change now because Chrissy Birkman has uh, has quit. Uh, he's uh, he's going to work on other projects um, after 20 years. So uh, you have uh, Karin Gunnarsson instead as the contest producer and um, to to uh, work with the, the appearance on stage. The show production is uh, Lotta Furebe in charge. So it's basically he's being replaced by two people, uh, which is mm -hmm. that's how it's described at the moment. Um, about the same composers, um, it's important to realize that you have 28 songs every year and uh, Sweden is not that big a country and uh, you don't have that many people writing great pop music. So, you know, it's natural that the same people are going to appear again and again. And no one is, is saying that it's surprising that Lionel Messi is on top of, of um, the scoring league in the Spanish league in football every year. Uh, it's because he's, he's one of the best. And uh, obviously you have songwriters who have the same position in the, in the world of Swedish pop music and Melody Festival. And they are going to appear again and again. Um, but uh, I could also agree that it's, uh, Melody Festival had the aim to include all popular music. Uh, if you look 10 or 15 years ago, and Christy Birkman said that Melody Festival should be a platform where all pop music is, is represented. Um, but uh, uh, then somehow it changed uh, some, some seven years ago, perhaps, and the rhetoric changed into Melody Festival and has a backbone, which is pop music. And it should go to the charts, and this means a lot to look at how the songs are charting on Spotify. 
and uh, then you have uh, uh, small exceptions to this here and there uh, that, that provides variety. Uh, so if this was a change somehow in, uh, in the, how multifaceted was viewed. And this is certainly something that could be changed in the future. Uh, there's a potential here to, you know, what, what are we doing for men, uh, grown-up uh, heterosexual men? Uh, they are not watching Melody Festival very much um, because, you know, it's very little rock music and uh, little music that appeals to them and it should be a contest for everybody. Then this maybe should change. And um, there are so many different kinds of music that you can bring in. Uh, which is not represented. Uh, the Swedish charts are looking different than Melody Festival. And so something could be done here. Um, but the question is, would this make Melody Festival wider in the appeal or more narrow? Because the people who are interested in the charts, uh, that's not the wide uh, public. It's, uh, it's a more narrow group than the people that are watching Melody Festival. And in that way, Melody Festival is the real representation of people's taste and the shorts are the small music bubble. Uh, let me ask you something about uh, when I, I was thinking about asking you about Melody Festival in 2008, but I think that we can use 2009 as an example too, and maybe even 2007. The, uh, I think that Sweden expected to do very well in Eurovision for three editions. I think that 2007. Um, the Ark was a big name. Charlotte came back with a very good song. And Malena uh, with, a, with something very different from what Sweden usually sent in 2009. Yeah. So, yeah. like, what happened during these three editions? Some, some results were quite shocking during the semifinals. I can point out Monza Merlot's result in the televote in the final was also shocking. So it was very, very surprising. Like the, these three editions were very shocking. Um, also, in 2010, the, the format changed a bit. Okay, so they were all announcing the, the winner of the semi final already, and then they announced the second placer, and then. That's it. But how do you feel that these three events changed Melody Festival? Hey, it's an important question. Um, we had four years there where we had problems. Uh, the public interest in Melody Festival was huge, but it didn't translate into success in the Eurovision Song Contest. And then you have, if you have a bad end product, it will not be as attractive for people to watch the national selection either. So it was really like, um, yeah, it was a problem. Um, and uh, you could see that Melody Festival was very popular and the, the big names in Melody Festival uh, went to the Eurovision Song Contest and didn't do well for four years. Um, in, the, in part, it could be exceptions, but it was also that Melody Festival was a little bit out of pace with the Eurovision Song Contest, because the Song Contest in, uh, internationally had changed a lot, because a lot of new countries came in and it was bigger, and uh, obviously the style and taste, um, that's, that's a new normal, it, it, it was not the same as it was before, and um, the cure for this for Sweden was probably to try to be contemporary instead of being what Melody Festival used to be, which is a little more narrow. And this was also very much um, in harmony with what the plan was for Melody Festival in any way. So, uh, but since Melody Festival is a very important tradition in Sweden, it's very hard to change it a lot rapidly. So Christa Björkman had a, this master plan for many years to, to do this. Uh, um, and uh, and uh, when we got the poor results in Eurovision, he, he took that as, a, okay, now I have the mandate to change Melody Festival in a little bit more. Um, because people were starting to get confused, I think. They, eventually they didn't know what to vote for, uh, because the ARC didn't cut it, uh, Charlotte Perelli didn't cut it, and then they, they just voted for Mariana Ehrman. It's okay, it's like, at least it's different. Uh, but it wasn't successful either, and, and then they still didn't know what to do. Um, so they brought on the international jury at Melody Festivalen, which started in 2009 and then uh, went into full 
uh, capacity in 2011, which immediately was a successful year for Sweden. And it's also important to note that there was a big change in uh, 2009, where uh, you had pre-recorded backing vocals, and you had eight people on stage. Um, and, uh, I don't remember if it was anything more, but the, I think the most important thing there was the pre-recorded backing vocals. Um, and why? Well, it's because when you didn't have this, you had uh, uh, backing singers on stage. And if you put people on stage, they, they should be backing singers um, and, uh, and um, should be able to be versatile, and then you can't get this uh, edge. Uh, but when you allow pre-recorded backing vocals, then you can produce bigger stage shows and more like pop music stage shows. Um, and this was probably important for Sweden to uh, also switch what Melody Festivalen is, so that it becomes more uh, in harmony with the Eurovision Song Contest, which is a, a paradox since Eurovision Song Contest does not allow pre-recorded backing vocals. Uh, but there's a lot of misunderstandings around this, uh, this concept, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, because now, this year, it seems that Eurovision is, go is, Eurovision is going uh, to allow pre-recorded vocals. And it seems that they are going to keep on this rule. So how do you feel about that? Do you think it's positive? Do you think there is going to be much more interesting stage performances? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I understand that some people are worried about this because it's called the Eurovision Song Contest. After all, you shouldn't have the pre-recorded vocals. Um, but the reality of this, if you're looking at what has happened in Melody Festival, and we've had it for uh, 12 years now, uh, is that the, the backing vocalists are not going away at all. Uh, you have pre-recorded backing vocals sometimes, usually, and you also have live backing vocals. It's very, very rare that you have entries without live backing vocals. Uh, why? Because live backing vocals sound better. Uh, the pre-recorded backing vocals usually have, um, it, it sounds a bit sharp, I believe, um, and you don't want to have just that. It depends which kind of song you have, but uh, you want to have the live backing, backing vocals usually. And also you want someone that can adapt to what the lead singer is doing. So you, you can have these dynamics. Maybe the lead singer has some vocal problem or something, and then you need someone that can just help a little bit. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things that could happen. Uh, so, but this backing, pre-recorded backing vocal things means that you can have big choirs in songs that require big choirs. And you can have... Uh, kinds of music that you have problems representing previously. You had these songs in Eurovision a lot, but they have just not sounded as good as they could have sounded. Uh, so you have this rule change that makes the music sound better. You're not removing live backing vocals at all. Well, that's very positive in, in, in my world. Hmm. So let me ask you a, a different question. This question is not uh, related to Melody Festival, but it seems that some countries this year they allow it live instruments. So we have Denmark, like they have like this small orchestra. Uh, Norway, they also allowed a, ba uh, a band to, to perform their live instruments. And there was also a guy in Portugal playing the guitar live. So how do you feel about that? Do you think this, you can take this to Melody Festival and do you think Eurovision should also allow some uh, um, live instruments? Because back in, in 2009, there was like Quartissimo representing Slovenia and they really wanted to perform the song with their live instruments and they were not allowed. How do you feel about that? Yeah, in Melody Festival, and I don't know uh, now actually, but I think this rule still stays. Uh, but we, for a long time, had a rule where you can have one uh, uh, live instrument. Um, so if you have some kind of um, solo uh, instrumentalist, this uh, person can actually perform live. Uh, but this rule, um, this has been utilized very, very sparsely, very few times, um, because it's hard with the mix to make it really sound good. And at the end of the day, most uh, contestants uh, step away from this, because if you can have it pre-recorded, it sounds better. <laughs> I'm sorry, most people think that it sounds better. And um, 
then uh, then they just opt, I think, for the pre-recorded option. But why not uh, have a rule where you allow a uh, live instrument, uh, like one or two or whatever, um, if some people want it? Um, I believe that there are some technical difficulties there, but it's not huge. You can solve it. Uh, so, in my opinion, yeah, I can't see why you, you wouldn't allow some live instruments if some people want it. Most will not want it anyway. Okay, so back to Melody Festival. From 2010, non qualifier to 2012, a winner. And I think that Lorraine influenced Eurovision in a very positive way. I think that many things change after Lorraine. And do you think what what do you think was the trick? You know, what what was that point that okay, this made us win that edition? Like what was the magic behind it? Um, well, I think Euphoria is a one of a kind. Uh, so uh, when you're talking about Euphoria, uh, maybe Lorene felt that she could do um, something a little bit more extraordinary thanks to the direction that Melody Pistolen had moved. And maybe acts like the Ark provided some kind of subtle inspiration there to say that you can go to Melody Pistolen and do your thing and uh, you can have complete integrity. Uh, because that's what Melody Festivalen has, has been for a very long time. If you're a big name, you can just have a free artistic integrity, create what you want to create, and you get the resources to do it, a great stage. Um, so so it, it's very artistic in that way. And uh, for Loreen, I think the, the secret was um, uh, how this happened, because it was a bit rare how it happened. They had this good hit song, Euphoria, which sounded rather similar to um, what it did sound eventually in the Eurovision Song Contest. But um, uh, it was just a pop song. And then Lorene came and she wanted to change it completely. And um, she was offered the song and she changed it completely. Yeah, and she removed the up, up, up and <laughs> that, that part. And then it's like, it wasn't a hit song anymore. And the songwriters were like, oh no, what's going on? This is destroying the song. We will not have a hit anymore. It's just um, like an artistic um, soundscape. And uh, then uh, they, they were allowed to change it back. And then Lorene was wanted to change it back. And they were talking and talking, and there was a lot of discussions for months during all autumn. And finally, they came to uh, um, some middle ground where they had a hit song, but it was still very artistic, and Lorene had her own integrity. And it, they managed to be successful in this balance. Uh, but we shouldn't underestimate the visuals presentation on stage. For sure, obviously. Yeah, it was a very successful choreography made by Ambra Succi. Um, and, um, you know, with the snow, with Lorene's mystical presence, this um, it, it was very successful and it was a bit rare, you know, even using the snow as a special effect in an artistic way, like it's some kind of Japanese uh, historical setting, you know, this, yes. this is an image that it's rare and um, and also just to, to be arty in Eurovision, it it's, uh, usually pays off if you can combine it with a hit song. This was also the secret behind uh, winning in 2015, that you convey emotions and art and you have a, a hit song. Uh, you know, so that, that's a combination that, that is potentially very successful. Mm. Yeah, uh, th th this, is a, this is another question. It's about most performance because it, it feels that Loreen she changed like the paths of the performances and then Mons came up and changed again so do you think it's very hard for Sweden to come up with like better performances because like you cannot you can you have to top these performances all the time I think that maybe some of the best staging acts in Sweden were this you off I think that Eric Saad, also this edition, he did something amazing. Back in, in 2011, it was already very interesting. But, like, how do you guys feel? Like, you have to top those performances. Don't you think it, it's very difficult 
how do you feel about that? It's a challenge. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that uh, sometime in 2016 or something like that, Melody Festivalen had um, uh, huge uh, stage shows and uh, the, the development was heading in that direction. Um, and um, uh, eventually it seems that you, you hit the roof there. Uh, you come to a point where it's hard to, to do that more and better because you've done You've done it all that technology can uh, can give you, and um, then you you need to go somewhere else and maybe take it back uh, a notch, or you know. So so it's complicated, but I think that you know we, we have these amazing um, um, opportunities with technology nowadays to do fantastic stuff on stage, and you just need to be a visionary to come up with something great. You know, like Mo Salmanov, he has a, like, this green. And then you have a, a really artistic guy who creates this straw man, which was very inspired by, by a French uh, artist. But anyway, it's, it was something that told the story in an artistic way. And uh, I think there's an amazing potential there if you can bring yes, true artists into a Melody Festival and to create stage shows, like, and then put that together with the, the, the professionals that create stage shows um, that are very much hit music like um, and then you can come up with great new things that maybe maybe we have um, that's a good direction to go for melody festival and because now um, now it's like um, we have these great stage shows and then we take it back and then so I think we're in, in some kind of middle ground now where it's kind of <laughs> it's on the same level and we how where are we going to go how are we going to make it even better because eventually you you would want to make it even better so uh something else i would like to ask you is the role of social media in a melody festival what do you think like what's the impact of having so many people giving their opinions on twitter on facebook on forums how do how, do you guys follow these ideas or are you just, oh, these people know anything, let's just ignore them, they're just hateful people and they have nothing else to do, let's just ignore them. Or do you really take, okay, let, let's listen to what they say, let's listen to their opinion and try to change our paths. Um, I don't think that we're looking at uh, what people are casually writing on Twitter when it comes to how to model the TV show. Um, it's more like you, you would use focus groups and uh, you know, uh, maybe people like me who, who are checking. Uh, I'm going there on, on um, evaluation after the 2021 season now and uh, with the project manager and uh, she's probably going to ask me what people were saying on social media for example uh, and I you know you have a guy like me and I, I'm putting this together into some ideas and suggestions for the show maybe um, but it's very important that people are you know engaging with the show and this is what SVT try to encourage and also to give them um, um, to show show that that we we see them and we can talk to them, we can answer the questions. Um, so that's what the social media strategy was about this year. I wasn't involved in uh, the active work there. I was uh, advising them a little, basically, but uh, I wasn't working with it at all. Um, but um, I'm tweeting from my personal account, like to to uh, uh, provide pr promotion for for the articles that I wrote, and also to like fill in the blanks where with the information that I think that um, people would miss otherwise. Um, but it's really important to have the, the people talking on social media. Uh, people are watching Melody Festival in, in broadcasts in the old fashioned way on TV. Um, like in, it's like this campfire show that, that gathers the family. Um, but they are not watching it very much online in the webcast version for, on streaming. Uh, so it's like 5 or 10% only of the people who are watching the show are watching the streaming. Uh, so this is a problem potentially for the future and uh, you really need to work hard there uh, if Melody Festival wants to stay relevant and have a, a big audience. And we did used to have a big website and I was the, the manager of that website and this was very successful and we had like one million visitors to the website and then you had the show on the website and you could have had social media interactions there and the integrations and this could have been a way to, to boost uh, online streaming viewing of Melody Festival and then it would have given it a completely different uh, <coughs> different prerequisites um, that uh, that would make it 
better uh, suited for the future. And now we do have this problem. The, the viewing figures were dwindling a little bit last year. Uh, this year it went up again due to the pandemic. But uh, what is it going to be like when the pandemic isn't there and people have a lot of other options? Uh, so Melody Pistola really has um, there's a big big job to do there. And the reason why the web page was removed was, uh, of course, policies, you know. Um, there, there are uh, Melody Festival and SVT are, are doing a TV. It's a public service TV company. So should SVT do a lot of websites that provide competition to the evening newspapers and so on? Because the website was so successful that it, it took away market shares of uh, the biggest newspapers and put uh, svt.se as one of the most popular websites in Sweden. And um, the, eventually the, the policies have been changing and then we should try to encourage the outside independent journalists to write about it instead. And this is what I'm working with now. I'm trying to provide good information for them so that they can write uh, adequate stuff about Melody Festival and make people interested and hopefully have them to come watch the show. Okay, that's, that's interesting. That's a good point of view. But let me, now I'd like to ask you, you were talking about the public and it feels that the results nowadays, they are more and more predictable. And you, if you take a look at the numbers, um, for example, Eric Saad and Dani Salcido, they would not have gone straight to the final, on, solely on the televote. So how do you feel about that? Do you think that the app changed Melody Festival and results because for example i remember that in 2007 we had some shocking results like mary lindberg sarah don finer qualified straight to the final and she was not a big name back then so how do you feel that the app is changing the results in melody festival and do you think that if we had only televote would you, we have maybe a different winner or a different qualifier in some semifinals? Uh, it's possible that it would be a little bit different in um, uh, singular entries, uh, but it, I don't think it would be very different. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure that we are not getting surprising results nowadays because, uh, you know, Mohombi wasn't expected to go straight to the final the other year and, you know, the, these things are happening quite a lot. Um, but this year we had a very expected results. Uh, this, uh, especially, at least when it came to the direct qualifiers to the final from the heat, um, it was extremely expected. But uh, this could be maybe due to two things. It could be due to the pandemic, um, that people are voting safely somehow, voting for the names that they recognize. And it could also be possibly, um, uh, what was the thinking? Because uh, there was a lot of interest to take part in Melody Festival this year due to the pandemic, uh, because the big names doesn't have any anything else to do. And then uh, SPT could pick the biggest names with the strongest songs. And then the big names with the strong songs are more likely to go straight to the final than, than uh, the regular year, perhaps. Um, but the app is... Uh, it's, it's hard to say exactly how it's changing. Uh, it was a discussion previously that uh, it was causing uh, the, the youngest um, acts to go through to the final and, and be successful. There was like a junior melody festival. Um, but uh, apparently it was more like a trend where people were voting for young acts. And this, this is changing from year to year. And now it's not like that at all. Uh, things are changing rapidly when it comes to trends in pop music, obviously. So um, Melody Festivalen had changed uh, two years ago to make an age uh, distribution in, in points uh, rather than just counting the votes from the app. Uh, so now you have these age groups and this guarantees that all demographical groups can uh, have a voice in Melody Festivalen. Mm -hmm. A million voices. Like Tusa would say. Indeed. Let me ask you something. Uh, one of the songs of Melody Festival in this year, we, we usually listen to the songs like we are 
we are Eurovision fans, so we listen to the songs and we analyze and we try to predict and we say a lot of stupid stuff. And that's what we do. But let me, I would like to point one song. When I listen to this song, I remember Melissa Horn. It's one of my favorite singers, my favorite Swedish singer. You probably know her. Yeah, she's great. And, and Clara, her song kind of reminded me. I, I won't dare to, to pronounce her last name, okay? <laughs> but it's Clara with a C. Uh, so Clara, when, the, when I listened to that song, I said, okay, this is very good. And this is very Swedish. This is something that I would listen out of Melody Festival. In. This is something that is not really related to the competition. And she's probably going to not do well. And she did well. Right? Yeah. yeah. She qualified to the fight, to the, to the second chance round, and she made it to the final, and she, she got a very decent result. She, she, she did even better than expected. So, how do you think that Melody Festival has songs that are similar to the songs in the Swedish charts and in the Swedish uh, radios? Or do you think that songs like Clara's are like. Uh, an exception. Um, I don't know. It's an interesting example with Clara uh, Klingenström. <laughs> Clara Klingenström. Um, that um, you're right. That a lot of people identified her like uh, Melissa Horn esque. And um, if you look at the Swedish charts uh, right now, there are a lot of songs in Swedish there. Um, mm -hmm. But in Melody Festival, and the songs in English are, are the successful ones. Um, maybe Melody Festival has fallen just a little bit behind the curve, and this is going to be updated. Uh, but I don't know. Because Melody for Swan has, um, it kind of encourages a certain kind of songs with high energy and pop music and broad appeal. And um, maybe there are some types of artists and songs that are more about, you know, feelings that you need more time to build and the relations that you need a longer time to build. And maybe even just attitudes like you're, you're cool in some way, which is a little narrower underground or something. And people like you because you're cool rather than because you provide the best music. Um, so it, it could be anything. And Melody Festival is very unforgiving in that way. It's about those three minutes and you need to be able to deliver and to be on top for those three minutes. And it's more like a sporting achievement in, in combination with an artistic achievement. Um, and the, a lot of these names that are good on the charts are maybe not good at all to deliver in, in that circumstance. And uh, some, some even suffer from some kind of stage fright and to be in front of cameras in, in with millions of viewers like this for the biggest names this could be something that they, they don't think that they would like or be good at or, or even be able to stand, uh, which you don't think because they are big names. Um, so it could be a combination of those things. Uh, but Clara Klingström, maybe she's a door opener there and uh, you could see more, more songs like this. And uh, she did well, so, uh, so maybe some others could do it as, as well. She had a song also that's co-written by Bobby Ljunggren, uh, who's uh, the, the songwriter with the most entries ever, uh, no, second most entries ever in Melody Festival, the most entries in the final. And, um, so, so he helped probably to, to produce a mixture there, which is the same with Euphoria that we were talking about. You have a hit song that's good for Melody Festival, and then they have something from outside of it, and then you put it together. And if you're successful with the way you're merging those two things, then you can achieve something new and something that's potentially extremely successful. And Clara's Klingström, she, she was very sincere. Uh, she really meant what she was singing. And um, she showed that you can go to Melody Festival and, and, and just be honest and have something that comes straight from the heart. And this can be appreciated and recognized in those three minutes. And maybe people who was watching from the outside was learning something this year and we can see more of it. Hmm. Yeah, this is something interesting because I've, I think that not just not just in Sweden, but like in the Nordic countries, it feels that there are more songs in the charts in your native languages, so like songs in Finnish, songs in Swedish. And do, uh, do you think that Sweden is going to have more songs in Swedish 
in the next years of Melody Festival because it seems to be something that's very popular in the charts. Like Denis Alcedo is recording songs in Swedish, Molly Sandin is, is recording songs in Swedish, Darin is recording songs in Swedish, Eric Saad is recording songs in Swedish. So do you think that these songs in Swedish are going to be taken sooner or later to Melody Festival? Well, at some yes. point there has to be um, some trend like this in Melody Festival, and we have seen it a little bit that it, it has been easy to to get songs in Swedish to take part, but it, they still haven't been successful in the competition. And this year we got, um, for the first time since 2007, we had two songs advancing straight from a heat in Swedish to the final um, in the heat one. But uh, we still only had three songs out of 12 in the final in Swedish. Mm -hmm. And one third, roughly, uh, every year uh, should be in Swedish and are in Swedish. So um, it hasn't happened yet. Um, and maybe it's like people are still thinking that Eurovision is international. We are going to select something that should represent us internationally. We want to do well. And what should we do? We'll probably vote for something in English. Uh, it's an attitude thing. And um, yeah, and we also have the international juries, then it's harder, it's not impossible, but it's harder to be successful in, in Swedish. And um, so when you're, you're coming to Melody Festival, and maybe you're thinking that, well, I want to be top 10, and it's kind of hard, <laughs> you know, with international juries. Um, so maybe you need a door opener there, just like the ARC was in 2007 with uh, pop music, then you, you need a, a door opener in Swedish. Like Carolina Vuglas in um, uh, 2009, she had a song in Swedish that was very popular among international juries. So it's possible. So uh, I have another question. Um, Eurovision has been changing quite a lot, I think the audience. I think that I... I've been watching Eurovision since 2007, and it feels that there are different people watching the show nowadays. Like, it seems that it's a totally different audience. And I remember that back then, like, I had some friends that were, some friends that were Eurovision fans, and some of their favorites were Switzerland, in 2007, UK, you know? So mm -hmm. the, the taste of the fans were quite different back then. Do you think that the fans are ready to have Sweden sending a song in Swedish? And do you think that the Eurovision audience, the, the current Eurovision audience, would embrace a song in Swedish and would give Sweden another good result? Yeah, I do think that it would be that impossible. And I mean, if you have a good song and something that's sincere and resonates with people, I think it's possible. Uh, it's very hard to win. It's, it needs to be a phenomenon. But uh, I don't think that there would be any problem with the Eurovision fans. Uh, the fans would probably be very forgiving um, because uh, they think that Sweden is too competitive anyway, I think, and uh, would be happy to have Sweden sending something which isn't, you know, uh, which is different, you know, that they would feel that it would be very refreshing, I think. Uh, the wider audience, I'm not so sure. It, it might fly under the radar uh, a lot with the wider audience, uh, but, you know, it's not impossible. And you don't have to win every year. You don't want to win every year because it would be extremely expensive. So, you know, it's a good idea to send something Swedish uh, a few times, I think. I think Sweden is the country that has gone the most years without singing in their own language. Even Finland was singing in Swedish in 2012, uh, but we haven't sung in Swedish since 1998. Indeed. Long, long time. So, uh, mm. this question is, is just to to finish. <laughs> has been a quite long interview, but do you think that Sweden is going to be able to organize Melody Festival in several cities next year? Or do you think that the pandemic, due to the pandemic, it's going to be only in one city, maybe Stockholm? Um, I, if I would make a guess, I would say that it's probably going to be in one city, one set location next year. We would all love to have the arenas back as fans. Um, 
because it's a, it's the real thing and it's much better. Uh, but in order to plan this, you need to start planning very long ahead. And Sweden is a country which is very much about planning and organization. And um, if you if you still have uh, big problems due to the pandemic, they would probably be a little careful there and hold back and. Um, Put it in one uh, in one city, but who knows? I mean, maybe the vaccine will have a, a great effect, and uh, mm -hmm. society will open up. Uh, uh, we could see in Sweden that the, the uh, virus didn't hit at all uh, very much during summer; uh, it died away almost completely. And uh, then you got the vaccine, and um, you know, so maybe we'll, you will have a situation where you can start planning for a tour, actually. Uh, so let's see what happens. Okay. Gustav, thank you very much for this interview. It has been great talking to you, and I hope to see you soon. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. It's, uh, it's a very, uh, you have a very deep knowledge in Melody Festival, and it's really cool to see that Melody Festival spreads even to different continents. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a good memory. I have a very good memory. Maybe just like you. Not just yeah, like you, but kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's like me. I, I'm really impressed. So, yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you.